This morning I'll be reading from Ezekiel chapter 17 verses 22 through 24. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig and its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel I will plant it. I will produce, it will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of all kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. So life has a habit of throwing gut punches at you when you least expect it. Sometimes you see them coming. Sometimes you know. You're just waiting. But sometimes life happens and you didn't see it. A long relationship breaks up something that you thought would be there for the rest of your life. A doctor's visit that reveals that even though you feel healthy, you're really not. There's something really dangerous cooking inside you. How about uh, a chronic pain, something that doctors try to treat but it never goes away and you've got to deal with this 24-7 and you're looking at the rest of your life and you're thinking, how am I going to handle it? Or you have something like epilepsy, it owns you and you can have all kinds of drugs and miracle cures and yet seizures rack your body when they want to rack your body. You don't even have control over your body. Or you lose that job that you thought you would retire from. That job that was setting you up for retirement and suddenly, for whatever reason, economic shift and it's yanked out from under you, and now it's gone. Or maybe you're still looking for that job, you know, that job that's going to suddenly raise you up and get you away from these service jobs that you actually have to maybe work more than one job just to make ends meet, to pay the rent, to eat, and maybe have a little bit of fun. That just describes normal people. That's life, right? But add into that mix, you're a Christian. Well, what's Jesus done for you lately, right? I mean, I'll be honest with you, I never expected to go into a doctor's office and, and get some horrible diagnosis because, quite honestly, I thought being a Christian meant there'd be a hedge around me that would protect me from this stuff. Well, life woke me up real quick. How about you? You thought God was going to do something wonderful in your life, right? We, we preach this stuff all the time. Uh, you're a new creation. Yeah, I believe we're a new creation. But we have this expectation that this new creation would somehow manifest itself in, in the way we live. You know, you wake up and you're a Christian, you know what? You're still in debt. Your marriage is still rocked. Your kids still push your button. You constantly ask God, hey, what are you doing? I mean, respectfully, hey, what are you doing? I'm serving you, I'm believing in you, I'm following you, and this is the best I can get? You ever been there? I mean, you ever been there? And as bad and as disappointing as it could be here in the United States, and I, we, got, we got some stuff here in the States, the degree of pain and hardship for Christians in other parts of the world is even worse. There are Christians in Muslim countries, and I'm not dissing Muslims, but there are radical Muslims who kill Christians just because they identify themselves as Christians, you, you wake up every Monday and you got to face a week of, am I going to live this week or not? Am I going to get fired because I'm a Christian or not? You can be in India and Hindus don't like you because you're a Christian. You can be in Thailand, the most populated Muslim country on the planet, and it is illegal for you 
if you were born as a Muslim, and everybody is, to then convert to Christianity. It is illegal against the law. Think about that. Think of the repercussions of that. There are Christians who face the possibility of dying because of their Christian identification. So I don't, I'm not trying to be a, a downer, but that's what Ezekiel's talking about. I'm a, I don't know how many of you have ever read Ezekiel. I mean, it's a lot of chapters, and there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on in Ezekiel. I mean, crazy stuff. There's even one part of Ezekiel who, uh, a scholar who I respect, John MacArthur, he just said, I don't know what that is. I don't know what they're talking about. And anybody who even floats the idea that they understand that passage is just totally crazy. All right? That's what Ezekiel's about. But it's written to a people whose world is coming down around them. It's not written to people like us whose life and world is somewhat stable. Yeah, I just named some things. Ezekiel is not a book that's easily understood by us 21st century readers. But if you take the time to prayerfully read it and figure it out, yeah, there's going to be some question marks, and you can come to me, and I won't be able to give you answers because probably there's still a question mark for me. But there's also some rich stuff to get out of here. In the context of today's text, these four verses, is of a nation in ruin. Israel ain't, it's not around anymore. Uh, think about what it would be like for you if the U.S. was totally destroyed. Washington is in ruins. New York and L.A. and Houston and, and Des Moines are totally wrecked. And whoever did it, they came in and they just transported you someplace else. Because you're all, you're all the elite. You're the educated elite. And they ain't going to keep you here. They want to get you out of the land, and the only folks left are the poor and uneducated. That's what happened to Israel here. The Babylonians came, take the elite, ship them off to Babylon, and all that's left over are normal people. 2 Kings 24 tells us, in the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he took Jehoiakim prisoner, that's the king of Judah, and as the Lord had said before, Nebuchadnezzar carried away all the treasures from the Lord's temple and the royal palace. He stripped away all the gold objects that King Solomon of Israel had placed in the temple. King Nebuchadnezzar took all of Jerusalem captive, including all the commanders and the best soldiers, craftsmen and artisans, 10,000 in all. Only the poorest people were left in the land. Nebuchadnezzar led King Jehoiakim away as a captive to Babylon, along with the queen mother, his wives and officials, and all Jerusalem's elite. Well, what's the problem of taking all those people away and just leaving the poor? I'll tell you what the problem is. You've been to Detroit lately? That's exactly what's happened in Detroit. People move with money and ability, run to the suburbs. The tax base crashes. Detroit can't even pay its bills. It's not a good thing. You see, the Lord made us to be together in community. Those who make it and those who don't. Because they're all valuable in His sight, right? But this is horrible. Imagine that happening in our day and time. How would we react to that? You see, Nebuchadnezzar created a brain drain in Judah. Only the poor remained. And although it's, again, Detroit would be a good example. Philly is another where... You know, almost any major city with the ha gentrification hasn't started yet. People run away, and the inner city stuff just starts to crumble. Ezekiel's call from God came while they were in exile. They are not in the land. They are not where the temple is. In fact, as Ezekiel's message goes on, Jerusalem just isn't uh, depopulated. It's destroyed. The temple comes down. David's, all that stuff, it, it's just leveled. It's going to have to get rebuilt. They're deported from the city of Jerusalem, the city of David, and the city of the living God, and now they're living in Babylon. All that they had known and all that they had cherished has been torn away from them without any kind of consent of their own. They didn't uh, volunteer for this. This has just happened to them. 
uh, the, the military came in and took them away. And now they were in the middle of this vast Babylonian empire and were reminded every day who number one is when it comes to God. The Babylonian gods won. They're number one. Well, how do you know? Because you're in exile here, and our gods, we're powerful. We rule the world right now. And you, you Israel, you're just a bunch of punks. Our God's better than your God. The proof of the pudding is, if your God was top dog, you wouldn't be here. I think if I think uh, you know they're they're challenged at this point to be wooed by those gods of Babylon and to give up the god of the covenant that they had known from the days of Abraham. And I think that if you and I are honest enough with ourselves, we're susceptible to be wooed by the gods of our own culture, away from the god of the Bible that God presented to us in Jesus Christ. When the unexpected strikes at us and we, we, we just become a people who question God, okay, God, where is this? We, too, uh, become people who seek other remedies uh, other than God. We, 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 too, can become captive of the gods of our own age and, and lose sight of the one who saved us and promised to never leave us nor forsake us. In the last month or so, i, I got to tell you, there's been some huge uh, disappointments in my life. Things that I was sure were what God wanted to happen. They didn't happen. Now, I'm not going to say I was wooed by other gods, but I'm going to tell you it's hard when in your very inner being you feel that this, it's like, God, I know this is what you want. I know it. I can feel it. And it, it's not. It's those moments where your faith is so challenged. And it's in those moments where sometimes some people just say, you know what? I, I don't need this. Our God um, is mysterious. <laughs> I'm not trying to give them an out by saying that. It's just the reality. The God that we worship is mysterious. But one of the things that God wants to communicate to readers who pick up this book uh, is that throughout the centuries is that God is in control. Do you believe that this morning? God is in control. Now, I, I think we need to be careful to define control in the way that you and I try to express control in our own lives. But God is in control. Seven times in these verses this morning, this is what the text says. God says, I, seven times. And if you have a new Revised Standard Version Bible, it's more than seven. He says, I myself. He says, I will break off. He says, I will plant it. He says, I the Lord. He says, I dry up. He says, I the Lord have spoken. And he says, I will do it. He is reassuring people who are, can I say the word crap in a sermon? Crappy situation. But he hasn't given up on it. Life doesn't look like he's hanging out with you right now, but God's saying, I'm here in the midst of this with you. There's something going on here behind the scenes. You, you can see the power of Babylon. You can see the magnificent ziggurts, everything that's been built, the architecture and the hanging gardens and all that. Oh, the power is draped all over the place, but don't be fooled by it, God is saying, because I'm here with you. Don't believe what you see. Know who I am. Believe who I am. And I've, I've been with you guys for centuries. But I'm sure that the Israelites were saying to themselves, well, God, this isn't the way I would have done it. I would have done this whole thing differently. But that's just the point. We wouldn't have done it that way. 
But God testifies in another book by one of Ezekiel's contemporaries, the prophet Isaiah. This is what he says in Isaiah. Uh, this is God speaking. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Just think of it. Let that fit in there for a minute. My thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. So when you pray to God, don't expect God to do it the way you think it needs to get done, because he ain't doing it the way you think. He does it the way he's going to do it. So the core story of the Bible sketches this out for us. In the New Testament, the Jews are awaiting a Messiah who will finally free them from foreign oppression. He's going to kick them Romans out of Palestine, and we're going to be self-determining people again. We're going to have our own king. We're going to be powerful like it was in the day of David and Solomon. They're waiting on this Messiah to show up. They expect someone who's going to show up with an atomic missile, whatever, so that they can take over and kick these people out. And when the Messiah shows up, the one they're waiting for, guess what? They don't see him. He's right in front of them. I'm the son of God. I'm the son of David. I'm the Messiah. What? Almost sounded like Scooby-Doo right there. What? Sorry. I guess that's two things you shouldn't say in a sermon. But anyway. I mean, Jesus shows up. He's the Messiah. Where is he born? He's not born in royal claws in the palace. He's, in, he's with the animals. He's in a manger, where, you know, a feeding trough. His parents are common. His mom was pregnant before they even, he, she even knew her husband to be. And then when you come to the end of his life, he dies on a cross like a common thief, stripped naked, ashamed, thrown, you know, thrown to the public. We're shaming this guy. The Romans are saying, we got you, Jews. Look, we killed this guy. He's got no power. And then he's even buried in a borrowed tomb. And yet, this was God's power personified. You see, his thoughts aren't our thoughts, and his ways are not our way. Commoner was the son of God. That commoner was the Messiah. God's ways of power are not like our ways of power. We look for missiles and guns and arms and strength and body armor. And you know what God looks for when he's going to exert himself? He looks for humble servants. That's the picture that Ezekiel paints. While Israel is in ruins, Ezekiel tells the story of God who has never left them and who is doing something behind the scenes. Just listen to this. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Sovereign means he's number one. All right. I myself will take a shoot from the top, very top of a cedar and plant it. This is all imagery. Don't take it literally. He's painting a picture. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. God is going to do something about creating a kingdom. You see Babylon all around you. I'm creating something bigger, higher, cooler, more livelier. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on, he says, and this kingdom is from the Lord. I will do it. It's not coming from the Babylonians. It's not coming from your best efforts. It's something I'm creating. And then he goes on. He says, on the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. I will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it, and they will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. In other words, all these kingdoms are going to know. All those principalities and powers are going to know that God did that. But he's going to take some lifeless tree and make it flourish. He's going to take some short sapling and make it really big. So big that all kinds of birds will be able to nest in it. I don't know how the Israelites felt about that. They might have thought, 
This should only be an Israelite bird, that, well, but it's all for gift to nesting. And this is just a reminder for when your life takes a left-hand turn. It's not a promise that you're going to survive whatever that left-hand turn is, whether you might not survive cancer or whatever else could be coming your way. You might never have a cure for epilepsy. Uh, diabetes might have its way. But it's a reminder that when whatever that thing is in your life, you take a left-hand turn, that there is something of a promise that you are a part of, and that something is bigger than just you yourself. You are actually, as a Christian, part of something that is so huge, it is universal, if not galactic. Because, you know, God created the galaxy, not just this earth. There is something going on in the thoughts of God that will turn out to be amazing. And you and I, in our own small way, play a part in it. We are players in the plan of God. Think about that. We're not bench sitters. We're actually players in the game of what God's doing. Now, you might feel like a bench sitter. Can I say you're not? You are a, you know, so Paul uses that body terminology. How can the hand do if the ear doesn't hear and all? You know, he's basically saying everybody's got a part to play. We weren't picked last. We're not left on the bench. Jesus' death on the cross tells us that we're all part of this thing that, that, that God is doing, this big thing. And I think it's cool that this tree will give shade and rest to every kind of bird in the air. Not just one species, but all species. And I can't help but thinking about Revelation 7. I even think I read this last week. Revelation 7, 9 says, After this, this is John reading this vision, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and, the lamb, and to the Lamb as well. There is this thing that God is building that every nation, tribe, people, and language will give praise to God because they will fall into alignment and worship of this God, the Lamb. Jesus tells us a similar story in the Gospels, and I'm going to just go to Mark 4. Uh, what can we compare the kingdom of God? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and, uh, and uh, branches out large branches so that the birds of the air can rest in its shade, take, make nests in its shade. Hear the similarity? This is what our God's doing. Something that's not just for one particular group or class of people, but something that is for everyone. The opportunity is provided by God for people to nest in the shade of this thing called the kingdom of God. The story goes on. The tree keeps growing. All the different birds of the air, you, me, and that other person that maybe you know are finding shade in its branches. It, it might not mean that everything works out for you or for me, or that other person when it comes to our personal lives. But it does mean that when it comes to our faith, we're part of something that isn't going to end. We're investing energy and money and thought and time and all this stuff into something that is going to pay off in the end. There's going to be a victory. And wrongs will be righted. And justice will prevail. And mercy will come down like the rain. That is what we're invested in as Christians in a local church. And no matter what it looks like right now, there's something really amazing coming down the pike. And that's meant to encourage us when your life takes a left hand. You and I have a God who will bring the plan to its fruition. And that plan calls for a new heaven and a new earth. New meaning, it's different. Yeah, there will be a great multitude who worships the Lamb. You and I will be a part of that worship service. And I here I'm, I'm going to close with another video. This was in our Father's Day lineup of videos. It's something that I've shown. I didn't show this video, 
but I've shown a video about this father son. They're called the Hoyts. And I've been thinking about this. There's so many different perspectives on this video, but this is what I want you to think about. Think about God as the one in the wheelchair in this video. All right? Just think about God being the one in the wheelchair. Let's run this. That's a phenomenal dad. And I don't show that video for dads to feel like, man, I'm a real punk now. You know, I just... God was never stronger than when he was on the cross. There's a lot of things that could represent the cross today, but a wheelchair to me is a sign of weakness to many ways. And yet strength. When I was listening, you know, look, as a church, we're the body of Christ. And we got to run with Christ, right? That's one of them. But he also says the reason that dad's running is because of the heart of the son. We run because of the heart of God that it challenges us. And our, our God might not show up all the time, but do you love him enough to run with him? This is not about, God, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. This is, you did this for me. I'm doing it for you if I never see you the rest of my life. Out of his weakness, we live in strength. He's going to do something amazing. We know that already. We're just waiting. We run with him. We can't run alone. We can't run alone. We need each other. We need God. This is what church is about. We have to hang together and do it together. That's one of the reasons why we got 34 people in my favorite song. You might think that's not a big deal. Well, you know what? It is a big deal. I'm hoping we'll get 34 people at Juneteenth sometime. I'm hoping we'll get 34 people at the Dr. King breakfast. I'm hoping we'll get 34 people at the GLS. I'm hoping we'll get 34 people at the rescue mission. I'm hoping we'll get 34 people that, that will so blow up with the love of Christ that the 34 people will bring guests to church some Sunday. And that those people that come with them will come to know Jesus Christ. That's what I'm hoping. But we can't do it if we're running around doing whatever we want to do. We've got to come together and we've got to do it because we know that God's got something amazing planned. I, maybe I'm confused. Maybe I'm idealistic. But that's what, I'm, that's what I see. Uh, praise God for Hoyt, the Hoyts and what they're doing. Praise God for what God's doing here in this church. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for gathering us here this morning. What a privilege it is to serve you. What a privilege it is to be counted in your family. What a privilege it is, Lord, that in your weakness you make us strong. What a privilege it is to have a hope that many people in this world don't have. We have a hope founded on the living God. And as the last text in today's text says, I, the Lord, will do it. And, Father, I'm counting on that, that you're going to do it. My faith is locked into that. And I know that the cross is a step, that there's a new heaven and a new earth. And I, I look forward to that day. But in the meantime, Lord, I've got to live this life. I've got to represent you. We need to represent you. We need to be the light. We need to be salt. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, we all say amen.